Mike Pushkin is the state Democratic Party chair. He is a member of the House of Delegates as well. He joins us via telephone. Mike, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me back on. It is wonderful to, wonderful to speak with you again uh, to get the, uh, the Democratic uh, perspective on the governor's state of the state last night. Mike, what were your initial thoughts as you heard the governor move on until uh, 8.33 last night is when I clocked him as being finished? Yeah, it was uh, it was one of his longer. I believe it's one of his his longer uh, state of the state addresses. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if it was one of his more uh, substance. You know, didn't have much substance to it. Uh, what was rare though, he, he he seemed to stay on script more than usual, and, and you know, and that's fine. Uh, but I think a good, at least most of it, the beginning of it, it was uh, uh, a lot of looking back and. Uh, a lot of you know patting himself on the back and then taking a lot of credit for let's face it some things that were also a result of uh, some of the legislation that passed during the first two years of the Biden administration when uh, when the House of Representatives and the Senate were both in uh, in, in under Democratic majorities they were able to pass the American Rescue Plan they were able to pass uh, the uh, bipartisan Infrastructure Act. They were able to pass the Inflation Reduction Act, and a lot of that led to a lot of this, uh, in, the incentives to is for companies that, that are investing here to grow, and the incentives incentives for them to invest in places like West Virginia. So while there's been a lot of good news, largely as a result of, of those pieces of legislation, um, you know the uh, you know the, the governor spent a, a lot of time taking credit for it, uh, and you know. Really, quite frankly, in many parts of the state, a lot of people really aren't feeling the, the benefits of all this. There's still a lot of, we still have a lot of work to do. There are a lot of people struggling throughout the state, and uh, and you know the uh, governor didn't talk really enough about that. Um, I would like to talk about a few things that I do agree with him on. Okay. To start off with, and I think that he will have hopefully a bipartisan support for, and that's the, the elimination of the tax on Social Security. Uh, I think that's long overdue. I don't think we should be uh, you know, taxing people on on their benefits, things that they've worked for, and um, I believe the uh, one thing that might have a little tougher time, but I know the uh, the the Democrats in the Senate and the House would support is the uh, the tax credit to help people uh, afford child care. Uh, that is a workforce issue. We have a major child care crisis in this state, and we also have incredibly low workforce participation. That's a big part of it. Uh, we have to uh, help people that, uh, that need the help to afford that. But the, the, the other side of that, though, is, is access. Uh, there's just not enough access. Even if, for folks who can't afford it, there are waiting lists because uh, there's not enough child care facilities. So uh, one thing that uh, we're proposing, and I believe this has bipartisan support as well, it's as simple as this, just to uh, uh, count the, um, the way we would measure the uh, reimbursement rates uh, for for you know, for those who get help with child care and uh, for the facilities is to um, base it on um, on uh, attendance rather than enrollment uh, and that's been a big problem where it's based on enrollment a lot of times or based on attendance now they're based on enrollment not attendance when it's based on on attendance you guys a lot of you know toddlers of that age you know they they catch colds they get sick they're not uh, they're best at showing up. And um, and it hurts a lot of these child care facilities. It's made it harder for for these child care facilities to stay in business. That's something that's very important that we need to do work on as well. Um, and um, also we would support the. I think it's a great idea to invest in West Virginia State University. Very good, Mike. Uh, you are the, the minority chair of Health and Human Resources, and the governor mentioned the three new uh, folks who are heading up the now divided uh, DHHR. Uh, give me some insight as to what this legislative year might look like in regards to trying to make sure that that has been an effective split. Well, I think we have uh, a lot of work to do. And, and, the, and those, I mean, I think they're all fine selections to, to head up these, these new departments. One thing that I've worried about all along is unless there is a real uh, culture change in these departments, instead of having you know, one large dysfunctional uh, department is having three slightly smaller dysfunctional departments. So, uh, a lot of work needs to uh, needs to happen. We're, I'm, we help uh, the, the the committee on health and human resources is going to meet one of the first committees to meet. We're going to meet this afternoon. That's one of the things that we're going to take up is uh, a bill that that deals with the the separation of these departments. 
but it, it leads me to something else when it comes right down to it. It's, uh, you know, under under one of these departments is, is our foster care agency. And while the governor, he brought it up that we still have this, this, this foster care crisis, uh, basically he followed, he, he, he followed that up just by saying, you know, we need to do something about it. Well, we don't have enough workers in CPS. We don't have any. And they, there was no mention of how we're going to attract people to that incredibly tough job. Uh, there was no real mention of of how we're going to, you know, help families and provide services for families before they get in the position of having their children removed from the home. No mention of that, and that's really quite hard to do when you're bragging about flat budgets. Uh, so yeah, I'm concerned about a lot of stuff that wasn't said. Uh, last night, mainly just paying lip service to uh, uh, to the the foster care crisis in this state, and as we know, one of the things that's led to this crisis is that we've been the epicenter of you know, the worst uh, uh, you know, drug um, uh, epidemic uh, you know, in the country, and absolutely nothing said about that last night about what we're going to do to continue to uh, combat substance use issues. Um, so I think that while it was an incredibly long speech, uh, there was a lot that wasn't said. A lot of patting himself on the back, but a lot of details that were just simply left out. John Gilstrap. So going back to the foster care issue, what would you propose as a program to to get ahead of the foster care program? In other words, in ways to fix it, which I think would probably be tied to what would you suggest as additional programs in terms of substance abuse? Well, I mean, there's all sorts of programs to address it. But when you're when you're bragging about a flat budget, you have to make cuts in, in those areas, and, and not even not even talk about about growth in those areas. We're talking about uh, different services that could reach out to families before they get to that point. We have one of the highest rates in the country of of you know where of cases where fam where the children are being taken out of the home. Uh, we would like to get to the point where we don't uh, we, where we don't need as many CPS workers as we do because uh, we'd be able to uh, provide services to those families so the children would be able to stay in the home. Um, but you know, we've gone backwards in that over the past few years as far as help for uh, for substance use disorder. There was a, a really a wrong-headed bill that that passed um, last year to put a limit on the amount of treatment beds you can have in each county. Um, I think. I think that that's wrong. I think it really goes against, you know, free market type uh, capitalism uh, when you're putting an artificial number on the amount of beds that might be needed in a county. You know, some counties might not need as many beds as they, as they set the limit at. And some, uh, like where I live in Canal or over in Cabell or possibly where you are, they might need more. So shouldn't it be based on need? Uh, rather than an artificial number that was created by the legislature, but that's already created some problems and limiting the amount of help people can get. So if you're, you're given the magic wand and whatever you're going to do is going to work, what is the string you pull to get to the point where we need fewer CPS workers and and fewer foster care facilities and beds? Well, I mean, it's more services to families uh, so they don't get to that point. Now, is that completely the role of government? No, but government needs to be looking at what they can do to help because we do have a crisis, and it's largely caused uh, by the drug crisis in this state that has led to this, the byproduct of it, but we, but we need to address it and do more than uh, what the governor did last night was simply pay lip service just so he could mention foster care and then go, n say nothing at all about the substance use crisis in this state. Uh, instead, he, he chose to paint a very rosy picture and because he's running for U.S. Senate. It was more like a uh, campaign speech than it was a state of the state speech. Well, and I think it was a victory lap as well. And, and you know, it's it's the end of, of an eight-year run. you got to give the guy an opportunity to take a, a victory lap. And, 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 it's a and, victory lap. I would like to see uh, people uh, from all over the state, you know, feel these successes, but they're not. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people struggling in this state. We got we have people leaving this state in droves. It's a state that young people are maybe not in your part of the state, but most of the state people are leaving in droves. That's a state where we're, our young people uh, leave as soon as they can, and, 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 and not enough young people are moving here uh, to grow the state, and that's why we have the workforce issues that we have. But isn't that kind of the point of the 
bringing in the new businesses and making this a, a more tax friendly, uh, more tax attractive state for businesses to settle and to bring in new families and new people and such. Isn't that part of that? Yeah, we're we're having the ribbon cuttings and we're and we're you know breaking out the uh, the golden shovels for the groundbreakings, but. Um, you know, it, the big question is who's going to work at these facilities because we're not getting the influx of people of of, of working age. Now, if, if anyone's coming here with the with the with the le- the uh, legislation that has passed, it seems to be more like a retirement age. That's who benefits from a lot of the legislation that's passed, uh, at least on the state level, over the years. Now, a lot of the uh, groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings we're seeing uh, that's coming as a result of a lot of federal legislation as I said before happened during the first two years of the Biden administration so what would you do to bring it to stop the 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 exodus of of young people and to bring in more At every single thing everything that we do as the legislation should be run through the prism of Will this attract young people to West Virginia? Will this make it more likely that young people will want to stay in West Virginia? And what won't do that are some of the extremist policies that have been pushed by the Republican Party over the past 10 years. That has led uh, to more people leaving. We, it, Which extremist, uh, as an example? So extremist policy from the well, first of all, I'd say the uh, outright uh, ban on reproductive rights in West Virginia. For starters, um, many things that the that the Republican supermajority have done over the years is just not aimed at bringing people to the state. In fact, it's had the, the opposite effect. Uh, the proof is in the census. Matt Harvey. Uh, Delegate Pushkin, I'd like to get your thoughts about the 5% pay raise that was um, – uh, announced by the go- well, not announced, but proposed by the governor for all state workers. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, we support the pay raise uh, as far as on the Democratic side. I hope that he has support, uh, you know, from from the Republican side, uh, most specifically from the, uh, uh, the the Senate Finance Chair. I've already heard rumblings that, that there's going to be some issues with some of the proposals that the governor made last night, but uh, uh, from the uh, Senate Republicans. <laughs> but uh, I, I think we should also be looking at a cost of living adjustment for retirees. That's something he didn't mention. Um, well, it's meant to offset the uh, the premium increase in PEIA. Uh, I think until we find, and something he also didn't mention was the um, the uh, uh, finding a, a, a permanent funding stream for PEIA. Uh, so we're not constantly having to uh, to to raise premiums or 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 uh, you know cut benefits. Uh, for our state employees. Uh, one thing the governor said uh, last night, um, I think he was like offered a challenge, you know, find one thing I've said that wasn't true, one thing that he said uh, that over the years that was a lie. And the first thing that came to my mind is when he said that there would be uh, no rate increase for PEIA on his watch. And uh, there was. Uh, so that was something he said that was untrue. Speaking about locality pay, um, do you see that there's any any possibility that uh, locality pay would be approved in West Virginia and, and your your support or opposition to such? I think it's something that we need to look. Well, obviously, y'all are in a, a much uh, uh, different type of situation than, than we are down here in the you know south, south central part of the state, and we need to. Um, at the very least, make sure that whether it's teachers, uh, correctional officers, CPS workers, that, that at least their pay is on par uh, with the states that, that you're competing with over in the Eastern Panhandle, or whether it's Virginia or Maryland, or, or in any border county for that matter. So it's something we're looking at. But I would like to see uh, th- that be in effect for, for, all, for all of those very necessary positions, uh, no matter where they live in the state. Uh, we're not doing enough. Uh, to attract people to public sector jobs. I mean, we have a shortage in the private sector. We're definitely not uh, doing enough to attract people to public sector jobs that are incredibly necessary. We still, to this day, have uh, the National Guard staffing uh, many of our correctional facilities in this state. That's unacceptable. I think he he suggested that that could possibly end by the end of the well, summer. I that certainly was... hope so. We've been under yeah. a state of emergency now for over a year. So, yeah, it could possibly end. 
that's great. It should have ended a long time ago. It should never have happened. We should be able to have enough people working in the public sector that we can offer the basic needs that a government a government needs to provide. That's correctional facilities, uh, you know, the CPS workers, teachers in our classroom. You know, when they passed the um, the birth to three, <coughs> excuse me, when they passed the, the uh, that birth to three uh, law, I believe last session or the session before, that's great. We all supported it, but it created another crisis where you have. Um, you know, aides in, in special needs classrooms leaving, and there's not enough help for our, our special education classrooms throughout the state. We have a huge shortage there of the children who need the most attention are getting the least amount of attention. So uh, basically what I'm saying is this rosy picture that the governor painted last night, uh, too many people are left out of it. Too many people in West Virginia are struggling. And uh, while he had, you know, was, was being overly optimistic and, uh, and giving this really a campaign speech, there are just too many people hurting in the state, not feeling uh, any of the effects of any of these uh, things that he's giving himself credit for. What would be the Democrats' priorities in the House for, for this session? Well, like I said, everything that we do should be run through the prison. Is this going to uh, bring people to this state? Is it going to bring you know, young, working-age people to this state? Is this going to make this a state that's more attractive uh, for people to stay. So, yeah, we do. We support the pay raise for public employees. Uh, we support any kind of incentive we can to help people get access to child care, to help people afford child care so they can go to work. Um, we would support a, a permanent funding stream for PEIA so we can uh, stop uh, raising rates on the backs of our, of our public employees, make <laughs> those jobs more attractive. Uh, one thing that uh, that I'm that I'm working on is uh, public uh, the reform of the Public Service Commission. Uh, we have some of the highest utility rates uh, in the country in West Virginia, and what we want uh, we want to make it easier for people to live here. It's harder to live here when you're paying more for your water, more for your gas, and more for your electricity in West Virginia. So we're looking into some uh, reform of the Public Service Commission. Delegate Mike Pushkin, our guest here on the program, he is the state party chair for the Democratic Party, also uh, obviously a member of the House of Delegates on the Democratic side. Mike, the governor mentioned the transfer rules and how it has led to such lopsided competition in some cases on the football field. I'm not sure if that's being seen on the basketball court as well and other sports too, but clearly on the football field we saw some insane scores this past year. Uh, and I think he mentioned 93 to 7 and 86 to nothing were a couple of those. He threw that back at the legislature and said, I don't know what the answer is, but it, something needs to be done about it. Is this a concern of yours, the Democratic Party as well? Do you really think the House needs to do something about this? I think it's something we should look into. I mean, nobody wants to see the lopsided scores that we had this year in football. And the governor said something to kind of struck home with me, too, is, you know, these kids have to show up and go to school the next day after they are beaten, you know, with 83 to 7. You know, we lose a lot of votes in the House of Delegates. I was thinking, like, you know, as uh, yeah, 89 to 11, <laughs> we still show up the next day as well. <laughs> but no, I, I That's a good point. something we should talk about, but we do uh, – you know, if they're talking about school choice, and if, if, I think what it, how, what started that that bill was uh, that they were going to allow for more choice for children that are in private schools or religious schools or homeschool that they could go and play in, uh, with the the kids in public school, and then they would be able to pick which school they played for. I think fair is fair, and if you're going to have choice for certain kids, it should be for all kids. But we need to look at and how we can make it more fair, and I'm sure there there is a way we can do this. Uh, definitely not something I'm a, an expert on as, as a high school sports, but I, I think that it's worth looking at, and I believe we will. I mean, we're getting a lot of uh, uh, feedback on it from uh, folks around the state, so I think it's something we will address this year. Did you get personally some feedback on that situation? Um, no, personally, no. I was mainly just looking at social media posts and you know, and reading the uh, the stories about it. But it it, it, we, it's, it is something we need to look at, and it, 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 there's there's probably a way to do it without eliminating it entirely. I'm sure. So I know the uh, Republicans are caucusing in the House each morning at eight o'clock this legislative session. What is the Democrat plan uh, in terms of getting together? Well, we're going to be caucusing too, just slightly later. No, we're going to be caucusing. Uh, you know, um, Minority Leader Hornbuckle 
has already you know, hit the ground running. He is very proactive, and we plan on uh, on meeting a lot more and having better communication throughout the session as well. I mean, we're a small group, but we're a very united group, and uh, and we work well together, and we plan on, on working across the aisle as much as possible, uh, working together on the issues where we can work uh, together, but also pushing back about, about what we would feel as extremism from the Republican Party when it does rear its ugly little head. So we look to uh, work with our friends across the aisle as much as possible, but we will speak up when we uh, feel something is incredibly wrong. Do you have any Republican allies on the other side of the aisle that uh, when Mike Pushkin comes to talk to them, they go, yeah, hey, Mike, what's your idea? Uh, more than you could ever imagine. Yes, plenty. Uh, we have, you know, it's about relationships, and uh, we we work together on on most issues. I mean, most of the issues are bipartisan issues. That's just not the ones that you talk about. But the vast majority of bills that that we pass are are things that there are bipartisan support for. And there are plenty of issues where people might come to me for my input on it, whether it's you know, issues related to, uh, um, you know, um, you know, mitigating the substance abuse crisis. Um, you know, or transportation issues, other things that may be in my wheelhouse. So I would go to a, a, you know, somebody that if it's, if it's an issue that I don't know as much about, like high school sports, I might go to somebody over there who's a, who is a, a coach. Now, speaking of, of, of high, high school sports and coaching, though, yes, I do have to say this. Of course, it was great that you know the, that the governor brought his uh, his basketball team in again, and you know. We, you know, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm, I've encouraged people to get involved with youth sports and be mentors. That's great. But when he was talking about he he said, I always tell, you know, my kids that there's no substitute uh, for being there. And uh, I, you know, I wasn't the only one that spotted the irony there, uh-huh. uh, but because the governor's rarely there. Uh, we He comes in and gives the state of the state address. We don't see him the rest of the session because it's basketball season. And... Um, and the state is suffering because of it. I could point. I mean, every single aspect uh, of state government, every department right now is in, in a state of dysfunction because the boss doesn't show up. Uh, it, you know, whether it's our, our 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 jails and our prisons, where we continue to have the uh, the uh, national guard staffing our prisons, or whether it's the DHHR that we talked about, which is now split up into three, but still. Uh, you know, not operating the way it should, and, and children are suffering because of that. <laughs> Whether it's uh, you know the crisis we had in, uh, in this past year with our state police, uh, the scandal that went on there that we're learning more and more about, and and we're getting more and more news out of the Department of Transport- Transportation of, of uh, engineers leaving in droves and just a, a complete toxic work culture that's going on in the, in the Department of Transportation. What do all these problems have? in common they're all happening under the watch of jim justice because there is no watch of jim justice he's not showing up and when the boss doesn't show up uh bad things happen so mike let me ask you to put on your your other hat as chair of the the democratic party for west virginia that's a lot of of negative messaging there perhaps earned perhaps not but what is the positive message this is a big year this is a big election year what is the the positive mes- message that you would like that the Democratic Party is is going to try to turn West Virginia blue again. Well, we are going. We are working on fielding a uh, uh, candidates that are very qualified, that are very competent, and and plan on uh, you know juxtaposing that against uh, our, our colleagues on the other side. And we've already had some really great candidates step up and 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 file uh, in coming weeks. You're going to see much more of that. But what I'd like to point to are candidates that know how to do the job and will show up and do the job. And then people deserve choices up and down the ballot. Mike, good to talk with you again. Any final thoughts? Um, well, I just, uh, like I said, it was, it, was a, it was a very long speech last night. It was a bit short on substance. I, I like to look like a, at, the, at where we do agree, and there are many things that we do agree with with our with our friends on the other side of the aisle. And I look forward to uh, we all look forward to working with them where we can. Um, but we're going to call them out when we feel they're wrong. Hopefully, there's less and less than that. Hopefully, there are more things that we can agree on. 
and more ways that we can work together for the benefit of, of all of the people in the state of, in the state of West Virginia. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic about it. I think we could have a very good session. But if they want to you know, start going down the wrong road and being more extreme, whether it's talking about you know, censorship in the classroom uh, or any kind of divisive issues that are meant to just make people afraid and mad at each other, then we're going to speak up. Hopefully it doesn't get to that. Mike, have a great day. Thanks for calling in. Hi, right, thank you. Mike Pushkin, State Democratic Party chair. He's a member of the House of Delegates as well.